Volume Two, Final Chapter of Memoirs of the Court of Marie Antoinette by Madame Campan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From the death of Louis XVI to the emancipation of Madame Royale. After the decapitation of the sixteenth Louis, some weary months elapsed, during which the condition of the hapless survivors of that most unfortunate of kings gradually but continually deteriorated they were stripped one by one of every resource that might tend to cheer or alleviate the sad monotony of confinement and they were now to endure the last extremities to which the fury of their persecutors could subject them the only comfort still left to them was that of living together and that was speedily taken from them a part of the enormities which they endured are thus described by one whose known partiality for the revolution and tenderness towards the motives and memories of its worst monsters such as robespierre pétion and fouché are too well known to require comment and who in consequence deserves implicit confidence when he feels compelled to state anything against them of course we allude to the celebrated author of the history of the french revolution and the history of the consulate and empire that wretch hebert the deputy of chaumette and editor of the disgusting paper of pere duchesne a writer of the party of which vincent roncin verlet and leclerc were the leaders hebert had made it his particular business to torment the unfortunate remnant of the dethroned family he asserted that the family of the tyrant ought not to be better treated than any sans-culotte family and he had caused a resolution to be passed by which the sort of luxury in which the prisoners in the temple were maintained was to be suppressed they were no longer to be allowed either poultry or pastry they were reduced to one sort of aliment for breakfast and to soup or broth and a single dish for dinner to two dishes for supper and half a bottle of wine apiece tallow candles were to be furnished instead of wax pewter instead of silver plate and delft ware instead of porcelain the wood and water carriers alone were permitted to enter their room and that only accompanied by two commissioners their food was to be introduced to them by means of a turning box the numerous establishment was reduced to a cook and an assistant two men servants and a woman servant to attend to the linen as soon as this resolution was passed hebert had repaired to the temple and inhumanly taken away from the unfortunate prisoners even the most trifling articles to which they attached a high value eighty louis which madame elisabeth had in reserve and which she had received from madame de lamballe were also taken away no one is more dangerous more cruel than the man without acquirements without education clothed with the recent authority if above all he possesses a base nature if like hebert who was a check-taker at the door of a theatre and embezzled money out of the receipts he be destitute of natural morality and if he leap all at once from the mud of his condition into power he is as mean as he is atrocious such was hebert in his conduct at the temple he did not confine himself to the annoyances which we have mentioned he and some others conceived the idea of separating the young prince from his aunt and sister a shoemaker named simon and his wife were the instructors to whom it was deemed right to consign him for the purpose of giving him a sans-culotte education simon and his wife were shut up in the temple and becoming prisoners with the unfortunate child were directed to bring him up in their own way their food was better than that of the princesses and they shared the table of the municipal commissioners who were on duty simon was permitted to go down accompanied by two commissioners to the court of the temple for the purpose of giving him a little exercise this wretch simon to whom was entrusted the care of the miserable child who born to so high promise so speedily fell to so sad reality is described in these words by cléry and no person can doubt that it was for his brutal qualities alone and the certainty that he would exercise them to the utmost for the torture of his captives that he was indebted for his situation as jailer and tutor to the infant hitherto so sedulously nurtured Quote, a man named simon a shoemaker and municipal officer was one of the six commissioners appointed to inspect the works and the expenses of the temple this man whenever he appeared in the presence of the royal family always treated them with the vilest insolence and would frequently say to me so near the king as to be heard by him cléry ask capet if he wants anything that i mayn't have the trouble of coming up twice on the third of july however 
even the last wretched consolation of suffering in common was thought too great a boon by the wretches who composed the national convention of france for those who had committed no offence toward god or against man unless it be a crime as assuredly it seems a misfortune to be born to elevated station a decree was passed on that day that the young dauphin or king should be torn from the arms of his mother when marie antoinette struggled against the efforts of the officers who would literally have forced him violently from her embrace until threatened by those fiends for men they cannot be called that they would kill both him and her daughter before her eyes when she released him not to see him on earth any more in an agony of tenderness and grief so touching that even her iron jailers melted and according to their own confession wept they wept at sufferings which they themselves had enhanced if they had not actually created and which they still persisted in enhancing to the utmost of their ability so strangely inconsistent is french if we should not rather say human nature with the child for the present we have done choosing rather to present the sad tale of the queen's last days in an unbroken thread than to interrupt them in order to treat of other matters which can in another place be more fitly treated for one month longer she was suffered to remain with her sister-in-law madame elisabeth and her daughter madame royale but on the second of august she was separated from these also and consigned to the common prison of the conciergerie as the subject of her trial or summary condemnation was already in contemplation she was then as we learn from du Brosat, lodged in a room called the council chamber which was considered as the most unwholesome apartment in the conciergerie on account of its dampness and the bad smells by which it was continually affected under pretence of giving her a person to wait upon her they placed near her a spy a man of a horrible countenance and hollow sepulchral voice this wretch whose name was barassin was a robber and murderer by profession such was the chosen attendant on the queen of france a few days before her trial this wretch was removed and a gendarme placed in her chamber who watched over her night and day and from whom she was not separated even when in bed but by a ragged curtain in this melancholy abode marie antoinette had no other dress than an old black gown stockings with holes which she was forced to mend every day and she was entirely destitute of shoes the only furniture in this miserable cell was a straw bed covered by a ragged mattress and an old worn-out coverlet and the various necessaries and decencies of life were denied to the woman in which light at least if not as the princess she was entitled to them but what were all bodily sufferings to the mental tortures which she must have endured she the fairest and most favourite princess of the proudest and most ancient house of europe that great house of hapsburg which had for so many centuries filled the imperial throne of the west who had exchanged those maiden honours only to become the bride of the most powerful king of europe yet mental sufferings and bodily affliction served only to bring forth the native dignity and firmness of her virtue if she had failed somewhat of the highest standard while seated on the pinnacle of human splendour and magnificence she soared even above it from the squalor and obscenity of her foul prison-house if not in all things equal to prosperity she proved herself superior to the direst adversity her serene dignity her proud self-possession her majestic mildness awed those whom it could not move yet let it be recorded that it did move robespierre for so deep need has that monstrous blot on the escutcheon of humanity of one redeeming trait that it must be recorded of him that he did strive to avert the trial tantamount to the condemnation of the queen his resistance was however of no avail he was overpowered by a huge majority and the trial of the queen was decided on the fourteenth of october accordingly she was led before the revolutionary tribunal at first the queen consulting her own sense of dignity had resolved on her trial to make no other reply to the question of her judges than assassinate me as you have already assassinated my husband afterwards she determined to follow the example of the king exert herself in her defence and leave her judges without any excuse or pretext for putting her to death the revolutionary tribunal had determined to sacrifice the queen but still even they felt it necessary as thiers states to produce witnesses le cointre deputy of versailles who had seen what had passed on the fifth and sixth of october hebert who had frequently visited the temple 
various clerks in the ministerial offices and several domestic servants of the old court were summoned admiral destin formerly commandant of the guard of versailles manuel the ex-procureur of the commune la tour dupin minister at war in seventeen eighty nine the venerable bailly who it was said had been with lafayette an accomplice in the journey to varennes lastly Balazé, one of the girondins destined to the scaffold were taken from their prisons and compelled to give evidence no precise fact was elicited some had seen the queen in high spirits when the life-guards testified their attachment others had seen her vexed and dejected while being conducted to paris or brought back from varennes these had been present at splendid festivities which must have cost enormous sums those had heard it said in the ministerial offices that the queen was adverse to the sanction of the decrees an ancient waiting woman of the queen had heard the duc de coigny say in seventeen eighty eight that the emperor had already received two hundred millions from france to make war upon the turks the cynical hébert being brought before the unfortunate queen dared at length to prefer the charges wrung from the young prince he said that charles capet had given simon an account of the journey to varennes and mentioned lafayette and bailly as having cooperated in it he then added that this boy was addicted to odious and very premature vices for his age that he had been surprised by simon who on questioning him learned that he derived from his mother the vices in which he indulged hebert said that it was no doubt the intention of marie antoinette by weakening thus early the physical constitution of her son to secure to herself the means of ruling him in case he should ever ascend the throne the rumours which had been whispered for twenty years by a malicious court had given the people a most unfavourable opinion of the morals of the queen that audience however though wholly jacobin was disgusted at the accusations of hebert he nevertheless persisted in supporting them the unhappy mother made no reply urged anew to explain herself she said with extraordinary emotion i thought that human nature would excuse me from answering such an imputation but i appeal from it to the heart of every mother here present this noble and simple reply affected all who heard it in the depositions of the witnesses however all was not so bitter for marie antoinette the brave destin whose enemy she had been would not say anything to inculpate her and spoke only of the courage which she had shown on the fifth and sixth of october and of the noble resolution which she had expressed to die beside her husband rather than fly manuel in spite of his enmity to the court during the time of the legislative assembly declared that he could not say anything against the accused when the venerable bailly was brought forward who formerly had so often predicted to the court the calamities which its imprudence must produce he appeared painfully affected and when he was asked if he knew the wife of capet yes said he bowing respectfully i have known madame he declared that he knew nothing and maintained that the declarations extorted from the young prince relative to the journey to varennes were false in recompense for his deposition he was assailed with outrageous reproaches from which he might judge what fate would soon be awarded to himself in the whole of the evidence there appeared but two serious facts attested by la tour dupin and valazy who deposed to them because they could not help it la tour dupin declared that marie antoinette had applied to him for an accurate statement of the armies while he was minister at war valazy always cold but respectful towards misfortune would not say anything to criminate the accused yet he could not help declaring that as a member of the commission of twenty-four being charged with his colleagues to examine the papers found at the house of septeuil treasurer of the civil list he had seen bonds for various sums signed antoinette which was very natural but he added that he had also seen a letter in which the minister requested the king to transmit to the queen the copy of the plan of campaign which he had in his hands the most unfavourable construction was immediately put upon these two facts the application for a statement of the armies and the communication of the plan of campaign and it was concluded that they could not be wanted for any other purpose than to be sent to the enemy for it was not supposed that a young princess should turn her attention merely for her own satisfaction to matters of administration and military plans after these depositions several others were received respecting the expenses of the court the influence of the queen in public affairs the scene of the tenth of august and what had passed in the temple 
and the most vague rumors and most trivial circumstances were eagerly caught as proofs marie antoinette frequently repeated with presence of mind and firmness that there was no precise fact against her that besides though the wife of louis xvi she was not answerable for any of the acts of his reign fouquier nevertheless declared her to be sufficiently convicted chabot lagarde made unavailing efforts to defend her and the unfortunate queen was condemned to suffer the same fate as her husband conveyed back to the conciergerie she there passed in tolerable composure the night preceding her execution and on the morning of the following day the sixteenth of october she was conducted amidst a great concourse of the populace to the fatal spot where ten months before louis xvi had perished Quote by Allison at four o'clock in the morning of the day of her execution the queen wrote a letter to the princess elizabeth to you my sister said she i address myself for the last time i have been condemned not to an ignominious death it is so only to the guilty but to rejoin your brother i weep only for my children i hope that one day when they have regained their rank they may be reunited to you and feel the blessing of your tender care may my son never forget the last words of his father which i now repeat from myself never attempt to revenge our death i die true to the catholic religion deprived of all spiritual consolation i can only seek for pardon from heaven i ask forgiveness of all who know me i pray for forgiveness to all my enemies End quote. She listened with calmness to the exhortations of the ecclesiastic who accompanied her, and cast an indifferent look at the people who had so often applauded her beauty and her grace, and who now as warmly applauded her execution. On reaching the foot of the scaffold, she perceived the Tuileries, and appeared to be moved. But she hastened to ascend the fatal ladder, and gave herself up with courage to the executioner the infamous wretch exhibited her head to the people as he was accustomed to do when he had sacrificed an illustrious victim Quote by la Cretelle. sorrow had blanched the queen's once beautiful hair but her features and air still commanded the admiration of all who beheld her her cheeks pale and emaciated were occasionally tinged with a vivid colour at the mention of those she had lost when led out to execution she was dressed in white she had cut off her hair with her own hands placed in a tumbrel with her arms tied behind her she was taken by a circuitous route to the place de la revolution and she ascended the scaffold with a firm and dignified step as if she had been about to take her place on a throne by the side of her husband the jacobins were overjoyed let these tidings be carried to austria said they the romans sold the ground occupied by hannibal we strike off the heads that are dearest to the sovereigns who have invaded our territory it is a little remarkable or perhaps we should say not a little remarkable that all the girondins who signed and sealed their own just condemnation by their signing and sealing the unjust condemnation of louis briefly followed her to the same scaffold we know not wherefore carlyle who so detests all human weakness defends and shrieks as he would term it over the weakness and guillotining of the murderers vergniaud valasi and their confederates while he has no shriek for their murdered victims it was not until the twenty second of april following that after the girondins after danton himself and others of the mountain had been decapitated some weeping some bellowing all blaspheming by the hands of the impassive sanson the king's surviving sister madame elisabeth was sent to death her trial says carlyle was like the rest for plots for plots she was among the kindliest most innocent of women there sat with her amid four-and-twenty others a once timorous marchioness de crusol courageous now expressing towards her the liveliest loyalty at the foot of the scaffold elisabeth with tears in her eyes thanked this marchioness said she was grieved she could not reward her ah madame would your royal highness deign to embrace me my wishes were complete right willingly madame de crusol and with all my heart thus they at the foot of the scaffold the royal family are now reduced to two a girl and a little boy this boy once named dauphin was taken from his mother while she yet lived 
and given to one simon by trade a cordwainer on service then about the temple to bring him up in the principles of sansculottism from carlyle we will quote no farther for in this very passage which he begins so nobly and pathetically before the end he degenerates into his usual pantagruelistic cynicism and grins and sneers like a hyena over the corpse of fallen royalty what right has he to pretend to the title of philosopher who puissant to destroy is powerless to build up who the habitual admirer of strong vice and derider of innocent weakness has no plan or counsel for giving the power to innocence or depriving strength of its vice two very brief extracts one from the memoirs of the duchess d'angouleme one from the pages of the english allison sums up this brief and sad tale the young prince was taken to that part of the tower which louis says had previously occupied and the manner in which simon educated him may be judged by the statement of his sister afterwards the duchess d'angouleme in her interesting history of the confinement of the royal family she says we sometimes received intelligence of my brother through the municipal officers but even that did not last long we heard him every day singing in company with simon the song of la carmagnole the marseillaise hymn and a thousand other horrible compositions of the sort simon dressed him in a red cap and a carmagnole a small tight jacket and made him sing at the window so as to be heard by the guard and taught him to utter the most dreadful blasphemies and curses against god his family and the aristocrats simon gave him the coarsest food to eat and made him by force drink a quantity of wine which he naturally detested the ninth of thermidor came too late to save the infant king of france louis XVII. his jailer simon was indeed beheaded and a less cruel tyrant substituted in his place but the temper of the times would not at first admit of any decided measures of indulgence in favour of the heir to the throne the barbarous treatment he had experienced from simon had alienated his reason but not extinguished his feelings of gratitude on one occasion that inhuman wretch had seized him by the hair and threatened to dash his head against the wall the surgeon nolet interfered to prevent him and the child next day presented him with two pears which had been given him for his supper the preceding evening lamenting at the same time that he had no other means of testifying his gratitude simon and hebert had put him to the torture to extract from him an avowal of crimes connected with his mother which he was too young to understand after that cruel day he almost always preserved silence lest his words should prove fatal to some of his relations this resolution and the closeness of his confinement soon preyed upon his health in february seventeen ninety five he was seized with a fever and visited by three members of the committee of public safety they found him seated at a little table making castles of cards they addressed to him the words of kindness but could not obtain any answer in may the state of his health became so alarming that the celebrated surgeon de Sault was directed by the convention to visit him his generous attentions assuaged the sufferings of the child's latter days but could not prolong his life he died of a tumour in the knee as it was said arising from a scrofulous affection but in reality from the miseries he endured in his confinement the horrible nature of his food and the filth amid which he was intentionally forced to live by his tormentors after his death the sufferings of his sister gradually diminished she was detained in prison indeed but was treated with some sort of humanity and decorum not as a wild beast but as a woman if not a princess it was at length agreed with austria that she should be released from captivity and placed in the hands of that power on condition of the release by her of the deputies placed in her hands by dumouriez as also lafayette and his associates she was released from the temple on the nineteenth of december seventeen ninety five the minister of the interior himself went to fetch her and conducted her with the greatest respect to his own hotel whence she set out accompanied by persons of her own selection an ample provision was made for her journey and she was thus conveyed to the frontiers she afterwards married her cousin the duc d'angouleme and obtained by her conduct at bordeaux in eighteen fifteen the highest praise for her courage napoleon is said to have observed with regard to her that she was the only man in the family by the death of the child dauphin otherwise louis the seventeenth the crown hereditary of france devolved on the head of the count of provence 
who became on the restoration in eighteen fifteen king louis xviii of france on his death without heirs male he was succeeded by his brother charles dix who lost his throne in the three days of july eighteen thirty he subsequently died in exile and the hereditary crown de jure now rests though probably it never will do so de facto on the head of his son the duc de bordeaux titularly henri v of france thus ends this awful history of crime and sorrow a lesson both to sovereigns and to nations would sovereigns or nations either ever give ear to the teachings of history but of a verity the course of human events as they occur age after age so similar as almost to seem the same go far to show the truth of the old roman saying that whom god willeth to destroy he first dementeth end of memoirs of the court of marie antoinette by madame campan recorded by celine major thank you for listening